Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to another episode of Itchy Mysteries. And following in the vein from last week's Brain Scratch, where we looked into a possible UFO abduction, I thought it'd be cool to look into a documentary about a UFO abduction this week. Didn't know that there was going to be some strong parallels between the two, but we'll touch on those as we go forward in today's review. Uh, the film I'm talking about is called Extraordinary, the Stan Romanek story. And let's read through the plot summary real quick here from IMDb. Stan Romanek is the center of the world's most documented extraterrestrial contact story and the multitude of evidence accumulated over the past decade has convinced thousands around the world that his story is true. I'm not sure who wrote this, but they're, um, they're put, liking to put a lot of words together that don't flow so well. Um, this documentary film takes audiences on a journey through Stan's past, present, and future with one goal in mind, help the world understand that no one knowingly chooses the challenges Stan and his family have endured. The film's intention is not to prove the existence of UFOs and extraterrestrials, but it does pose the question, what if this is all true? Extraordinary, the Stan Romanek story is about one man's evolution through a life he did not choose and the messages he is driven to deliver to mankind. Sounds pretty interesting, right? Uh, I saw it on Netflix. It is currently available there here in the US. I don't know if it's gonna be there for long. I'll tell you why by the end of this video. Um, but let's get into it. I actually tried to watch this uh, probably a month or two ago, just on my own, not thinking about it for this show at all. But then several of you suggested it, so I put it on my list, decided to come back to it. Uh, in my first viewing, I got maybe 10 minutes in and decided that uh, I wasn't really buying what I was seeing. Uh, it starts with his first alien encounter, which to me, looks like he is using a video camera to um, track a Mylar balloon that is flying around. I just, I don't know why there's always this assumption that when aliens come, they're going to be in this bright, shiny object. Uh, even our own spacecraft, is it really shiny, metallic all the time? Isn't it usually painted like white or something along those lines? I just, I don't get why that's always coming up in, in these cases. Um, but this time I stuck through it <laughs> and I'm kind of glad I did. Uh, honestly, for the first 20 or 25 minutes, I thought that this might be one of the worst documentaries that I've ever watched. Um, there is the way that this film is structured, I would say is kind of incorrect, at least from my perspective. Uh, it's not edited well in the slightest. They've kind of blocked it into three major blocks. The first block is showing you what they have that is evidence. And for that statement saying that, you know, they're not trying to prove the existence of UFOs for the first 25 minutes or so, certainly feels like they're trying to do that with the evidence that Stan has provided. The second section is much more interesting where you actually hear about it from Stan's own words. And it's obvious to me that he's been at least talking about this frequently, um, possibly doing appearances at conventions and stuff like that, because he's very comfortable when he talks about this. And it's somewhat enjoyable. I really kind of enjoyed the middle section, despite the fact that I already had these hard judgments that came out of that first 25 minutes. Um, and guys, I swear, I'm not being unnecessarily critical here, uh, but I am looking for information that is compelling. And, you know, for example, one of the things that occurs is uh, he starts saying that he is being contacted by these space children and they call him on the phone. And he has tape of this phone call happening between him and the space child. The space child's voice is quite obviously sped up tape. He either recorded himself or possibly his wife saying the lines for the space child and then sped up the tape to try to alter the pitch of the voice. But he didn't slow the tape back down. Like if you do that digitally nowadays, you can pop the pitch, but you don't change the actual speed. He didn't slow the tape back down. Like if you do that digitally nowadays, you can pop the pitch, but you don't change the actual speed. So the speed of this child when they're talking is really, really fast. Like they're like you've heard sped up a tape and you've heard this kind of thing before. It's just it's completely <laughs> unbelievable. Um, I'm sorry. I just did not buy it. The other thing is I have a bit of an ear 
um, for when people are acting, because I've directed a lot of people, particularly in community theater, and you don't get the greatest of actors in community theater. Uh, and one of the things that you do as a director is you work with them on their delivery to try to get them into a point where they're they're doing their lines better than than they could have without your help. I mean, that's that's part of your job. Um, some of these phone conversations that are happening to me with that ear, and this is my judgment call. This there's there's no proof that I could provide to say this, but for what I'm hearing in those phone calls, it is scripted. It is not delivered very well, um, and I really, I just don't believe him. Outside of that, there's another voice that keeps calling him to warn him about, you know, him speaking about this stuff, and it is quite obviously a, a voice that's generated from computer. You could literally go to websites and do this exact same thing. You can type in whatever text you wanted to say, hit a button, and it will spit it back to you. It's called text-to-speech. It's been around for years. I apologize for being so forward. It does not take us long to get your phone numbers. Our surveillance is mostly for passive monitoring, but it does come in handy. Brain Scratch is an awesome show. Um, and once again, the thing about that is when you hear a conversation that he's having with something that is obviously computer generated on the other side and they're interacting with each other, that pretty much tells you it has to be scripted because uh, there's no gap for someone to type in what their next line is and hit the button and to spit it back out uh, unless those gaps were edited, which I think could have been possible, especially in a piece of film like this, but I don't think that's how they did it. I'm pretty sure that uh, they probably pre-recorded all those voice segments. Uh, in one of the conversations, not with the computerized voice, but with the child's voice, I swear I could hear a button actually being hit for the child's lines. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was holding a recorder uh, next to the other recorder where he was recording all this and hitting the pause button as he got to the end of that child's line so that him and his wife could de deliver their next line in all this. What's unfortunate about this film is because they provide all that evidence up front, it, if you're critically minded like I am, that, that doesn't mean I'm a skeptic. It means that I challenge things that I'm seeing. Uh, it kind of blew all of his story out of the water for me. So then by the time I got into the middle section where he's actually speaking, uh, it was hard for me to want to believe what he was saying. But like I said, despite that, he's a pretty good speaker and I kind of was able to put all that stuff to the side and listen to his story again and let my critical brain start spinning again, seeing if there was things that I could figure out to help support or refute his stories. Unfortunately, in most of the cases that he's talking about, um, there just isn't enough detail. And you'll find that as you're watching this, a lot of his stories seem to just start in the middle uh, of whatever the occurrence is, and they don't really conclude very well. There's this whole avenue of storytelling where he's talking about this woman that is on the ship with him when he's being abducted, and then he eventually finds her in a convention, she's sitting in the audience, and he points out that, oh, that's the woman that's on the ship with me. They have her interviewed, but they don't have her confirm anything about what he's saying, particularly about her having an experience of being abducted and being on this ship. It's a really weird thing looking at it from a filmmaking point of view uh, and saying, why didn't you guys just ask these hard questions? And they're not that hard, quite honestly. If you're just trying to get to the truth of the matter, they're quite logical questions. Do you recall having any experiences like this? Have you undergone, uh, in, undergone, <laughs> undergone? Have you undergone hypnosis? Um, and are you recalling memories like this? Do your memories line up with the memories that Stan has? Do you remember seven children on the spaceship with you? It would be very simple and I think completely understandable to be asking those types of questions, but they don't seem to get asked. Um, I think I skipped it, but the third section is what I consider the expert testimony section, but it's just not very strong. Um, one of the strongest pieces of information that comes out of this documentary is that Stan draws um, a bunch of equations, and those equations are actually known as being real equations. And if you look at them, they're very complex in terms of drawing. Uh, or writing them out and memorizing that. They've also got this story that he is uh, dyslexic, that he was raised uh, dealing with dyslexia and going through that his whole life. 
Once again, no information to support that. It would have been super easy for the filmmakers, pull up his school records, um, check some of that info, see if it checks out, show us some screen grabs on screen, prove that he was in these classes, prove that he was dealing with that, uh, but we don't quite get that. Um, however, they do have a physicist that's talking about the equations and talking about that they're real. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that he didn't find some paper somewhere and memorize these things and then was able to redraw them at a later time. That's kind of the theory on it. I, I struggle personally with that theory um, because they are somewhat complex. Could you have memorized them? Yeah, sure, absolutely, if you work at it hard enough, but you'd have to work at it pretty hard. Um, I don't know, I, I still struggle with that explanation. Uh, but I don't struggle with some of the conclusions that I came to, particularly in the first section of the video. Uh, looking into it, it, it appears that he has actually uh, admitted to hoaxing some things that he did on a show that he was on later. Uh, he, he went back on the same show a year later and admitted to hoaxing some objects moving around the room or something along those lines. Um, he's probably best known, and I've seen this video before, it's what's known as the Boo video. Um, it looks like it's a shot of a window, and outside the window an alien head kind of pops up, does a little puppeteering, and then kind of looks around and then pulls itself down. Um, not very believable. When I see that footage, I always wonder why the night vision is on, particularly for how the room is lit because uh, if he would have really needed the night vision, he probably would have moved the camera much closer to the window, particularly if he knew that something was peeking in that window over and over, but he doesn't. Instead, he frames a shot from way back where he can interact in the shot, and that's part of the criticism I have about that video also. I don't know, guys. It was an interesting uh, hour and 40 minutes or something like that uh, feels a little bit long the third act where they get into the expert testimony stuff starts to get a little boring because they're not really digging deep on that kind of stuff they're talking to a few psychologists that are saying no he's not crazy we swear he's not crazy uh, apparently if you look into i'll have a link to the wikipedia down below on him as well um, it looks like someone challenged him to take a um, lie detector test Looks like he failed the lie detector test, but of course we've talked many times on this channel about uh, results from lie detector tests being inconsistent and kind of hard to lean on. So I won't put too much in there, but it is worth noting. Um, the biggest strange twist to the whole movie I found was at the very end, and this is why I'm not sure if it's gonna be on Netflix a whole lot longer. Um, at the end of the film, they talk about that he has been charged with um, child pornography, with having child pornography and distributing it. And uh, then the film says, uh, you know, but everything might not be as it seems, and it shows a bunch of articles from the time about a uh, software virus that is putting child pornography on people's computers and then getting them busted for, for having child pornography. Um, well, he was convicted earlier this month. So uh, not necessarily for distributing it, but for having it. Uh, something to the tune of 300 photos and videos. Uh, and he is awaiting his sentencing, which is going to happen in October. All in all, I give this thing a four out of 10, and that wound up quite a bit higher than I thought it was going to be, especially based on that first 20 or 25 minutes. And what's the connection between this and the Herbert Shermer story that I covered on Brain Scratch last week? Well, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, the same person that did the uh, regression hypnosis shows up in this story as well, and apparently he taught Stan how to do self-regression hypnosis. Um, they show some footage of it. I think, and I can't say for sure because once again, they're not really being clear with us what's going on in that footage. I think his wife might be in the room with him. I don't think it's a doctor that's conducting those sessions. Um, we already talked about in Brain Scratch last week about how that information can't really be relied on because people can be very creative and there is no rule that people cannot lie while under hypnosis. So um, I, don't, I don't know, but there is footage of that in this if you're interested in seeing it. Uh, if you're a believer, a diehard believer that is you know, not very critical, um, you're probably going to enjoy this a lot more. If you're looking for a piece that will help you determine the truth, it's not here. It's not here. 
outside of that, if you're someone that can enjoy something just by watching it and kind of keeping an open mind or as open as you can keep your mind while it's going on, there's a little bit to enjoy, particularly in that second portion. Um, but the third goes on too long and it gets really, really boring, like for the last 10 minutes right up to the end. It just, it gets really super slow. Um, but if you're still looking up to the stars like I am, hoping that one day one of these stories is going to pan out, you might want to spend some time with Extraordinary, the Stan Romanek story. Have you seen it? Tell me about it in the comments below. What do you think? Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with me here in the screening room of Itchy Mysteries. Hope you're having a great week, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Take care. Take care.